Sister Owens? I think you won the Fill Your Pew Award. <laughs> this is Easter Sunday. Out of all the holidays, I rank my favorites in order of the kind of food I get. <laughs> and Easter you get ham and deviled eggs. That's definitely one of the top of my list. The best thing about Easter, though, are the Reese's peanut butter eggs. Amen. <laughs> if you've never had a Reese's peanut butter egg, it's like a peanut butter cup, except because of the shape, egg shape, it has a better peanut to chocolate ratio. <laughs> and therefore is ten times better than a normal peanut butter cup. You can only get them in Easter. And if you want to bless your pastor and you're looking for gifts to give, I do accept bribes in the form of peanut butter eggs. <laughs> Easter is one of the most celebrated festivals of the modern Christian church. It started out, actually, a uh, long time ago. In Greece, uh, there was a god called Astore. In Greek mythology, she was the goddess of spring. Every year, around wintertime, everything would die. The grass would die, the trees would die, the flowers would die, the plants would die, the crops would die. And nobody knew when they were going to come back again. Everybody was afraid, everybody was scared. They didn't understand seasons or cycles. All they knew was, we used to have life and now it's all barren and death. And for about three months or so out of the year, it was like that. So when spring came, the grass started to bloom, the flowers started to grow, the trees started to blossom. Everybody threw a big celebration, and they celebrated the god or goddess of spring. Because that's what they thought happened. They thought if the god was pleased with their celebration, spring would come, they'd have a good harvest, they'd have good, good crops, everything would be great. Missionaries came along. The missionaries decided to convert them to Christianity. Now, one of the biggest problems people have with Christians are, Christians are no fun. I don't want to serve God because then I can't party anymore. I can't go out and have a good time and get excited and do things I want to do. Being a Christian is all about rules and regulations and it's boring, so I don't want to be a Christian. We like to party. We can't call it party. We have to call it potluck or banquets or youth services. But we like to have fun, too. The difference is between our fun and your fun, we don't get headaches the next morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the Christian missionaries knew that the people like to have fun. So they said, okay, you want to have a celebration? Let's have a celebration. But if you're going to celebrate new life and growth, let me tell you the real reason about new life. The grass grows into the ground, the crops grow into the ground, and they seem like they're dead. <coughs> but in the springtime... They resurrect, they bloom, they blossom. So you're celebrating this renewal of life. Let me tell you about how life really was renewed in the form of a man who came to earth, died on a cross, and three days later rose from the grave. And so they let them keep their party, but they changed who they were celebrating. Instead of celebrating a made-up God of the harvest, they celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Easter originally was on the vernal equinox, which is the 21st of March every year. But then they changed it to when we have Easter now, somewhere between the end of March and the end of April. Depends whenever Passover falls. Passover was a Jewish holiday that celebrated the Jews getting rescued, delivered by God out of Egypt. Uh, this week, Passover was Thursday. And so they celebrated, the original Christians, who were originally Jews at first, Celebrated right along with Passover week. Passover on Thursday, you got a Friday that Jesus died on the cross. Saturday he was in the grave. Sunday morning he rose again. They celebrate the whole week. It's called Passover week or Passion week, depending on what religion you are. But whatever it was, they were celebrating the birth and the renewal of Jesus. And somehow, from all of that, we got to an Easter egg. An Easter bunny, an Easter basket, ham and potato salad. And to a lot of people, that's all that Easter is. It's just a festival. It's not anything more. 
But I'm here to tell you today that there is so much more about Easter than eggs. Mm -hmm. There's so much more about Easter than a bunny rabbit hippity hoppity in the wall. Easter is about our Savior. Easter is about life. <coughs> Easter is about renewal and hope where there used to be despair. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. Then we're going to skip down and read verses 16 through 20. Matthew 28. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Let's go down to verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain, where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for an opportunity once again to speak your word. I ask you, Lord, <coughs> to humble me to a place where only you shine. Let this service be completely about you, for your honor and for your glory. And let me only speak the words you'd have me say. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. First thing the angel said to the ladies was, do not be afraid. And this is very understandable because ever since the dawn of time, and ever since man had a concept of life, we were afraid of death. More importantly, we were afraid of the unknown of death. What happens when we die? Where do we go? Do we stay in the grave? Do we go to heaven? Do we go to hell? Do we get reincarnated as something else? Do we become a universal consciousness? What happens to us? Man has always quested for knowledge. I always want to know what I don't understand. I want to know what I can't comprehend. I want to know the unknowable. It's a quest and a strive that we've always had to understand things that we don't know. And death is the great unknown. Shakespeare called it the undiscovered country. What's going to happen? Where do I go? What do I do? What happens the day after tomorrow? When I close my eyes here on earth and I open my eyes somewhere else, where will I be? People were afraid of this. They were afraid of the unknown. And so the angel said, fear not. Don't be afraid. The Bible tells us that the only one we're to fear is God. Amen. And fearing God doesn't mean cowering from him or hiding from him. It means respecting him. Giving him the honor and privilege that he's due. I honor my father. I'm afraid of his belt. <laughs> There's a little bit of a difference. You honor and respect 
your elders, those in authority over you, and that's how you're supposed to have God. We give God reverence. We give God honor because of his authority. But we don't have to be afraid of anything because if God's with us, there's no need for fear. Nothing in this world can overcome us if God is on our side. Nothing in this world can defeat us if God is on our side. There's no reason to be afraid. Now keep in mind the background going on here when these ladies hear these words and do not be afraid. Jesus was dead. Their Savior, their Lord, their Master, crucified. They saw it happen. Buried in a tomb. He was betrayed by Judas, forsaken by his disciples, denied by Peter, tried by the Sanhedrin, condemned to die by Pilate, crucified at Calvary, buried in the tomb of Joseph. Matter of fact, when the women came to the tomb, they were concerned and talked amongst themselves, how are we going to get in there? How are we going to roll the stone away? Back then, they didn't have funeral parlors. Funeral directors, they didn't uh, have embalming fluids. What they would do was, they would go in, they would wrap the body, they would actually mummify it, and they would soak the linens in spices and things that would preserve and things that would keep the decay and the smell away. And that's what they had. They would prepare the bodies. They couldn't do that to Jesus when he died because he died right as the Sabbath was getting ready to start. And handling dead people you can't do on the Sabbath. So they had to wait until Sunday morning when the Sabbath was over. So they get to the tomb to mourn the passing of their Savior. They walk up and they see an earthquake. They see the soldiers fall down. They see the stone rolled away. They see an angel sitting on top of the stone. And the angel said, hey guys, relax. Everything's going to be okay. He probably said that because they were about this close to fainting. Or screaming. Or running in terror. I don't know about you, but when dead people start rising from the ground, it's time to start running in terror. <laughs> this is not a usual occurrence. This is not something that you see every Sunday morning. So they were afraid, but he said, be not afraid. These unnatural things are taking place, earthquakes, angels. Easter turned the world upside down, completely on its end. Things that we never thought would happen, happened all in one day. But the response is, don't be afraid. Because as long as we have God with us, we don't have to fear the things of this world. Earthquakes, diverse places, attacks. I don't have to be afraid, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And if God be for me, who can be against me? Who can stand against me if God's on my side? If God's in my corner, I don't care how big the opponent is. I know I'm going to win. David just needed a little rock and a sling to take down Goliath. He already taken down a lion or taken down a bear. A giant was just one more step for him. It's no step for a stepper. Dealing with problems in our lives isn't that big a deal. We may act like it's the end of the world. We don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. God's got everything under control. He created us out of nothing. Do you really think he's not going to provide for you when you're in need? <coughs> he built you. Before the foundation of the world, he formed you. Do you really think that when a crisis comes, he's going to run high? He's going to be nowhere to be found. There were three boys in the book of... Uh, Daniel, that were under Babylonian captivity, and the king decided that he was the king. And nobody can beat the king, so they built a statue of the king and said every day when the bell rings, everybody's got to bow down to the statue. Everybody. If you don't bow down, we're going to throw you in a fiery furnace. I used to work at a bakery, and uh, one of the guys was sweeping, and he got the bright idea to sweep the stuff out from the oven. Now, the oven doesn't turn on unless it closes. It's a safety feature. Door was open. He walks into the oven to start sweeping it out. When he walks in, a lady not knowing he's in there pushes a rack past, and the rack pushes the oven door closed. The oven closes, the oven seals, and the oven turns on. Now, he's on the other side of a door, about this thick, screaming to the top of his lungs. Nobody can hear him through the oven. Thankfully... One of the cashiers turned around and saw him in the oven, ran, opened the door, and opened it up and set him free. You could see the bottom of his shoes were starting to melt and stick to the oven floor. I can't imagine a more terrifying place to be. 
Now there is a safe, just to let you know, there is a safety feature in those. There's a handle on the inside. If that happens to you, yank your shirt off, open the door, push it, and run away. <laughs> Get out of there. Don't stand and scream. But he didn't know that at the time. In the panic of the moment, it was dangerous. And these boys were going to be thrown into an oven if they disobeyed. And everybody bowed when the bell rang. Everybody bow, 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 bow. And the king standing there on the balcony looking at all these people worshiping him. I'm the king. I'm the man. Everybody's worshiping me. And he looks out of the crowd. <clears throat> and see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing there. All the king's furious. Who do these people think they are? Not only are they not bowing to me, but these guys are slaves. I conquered their kingdom. I destroyed their city. I brought them here in slavery. And they're still not going to bow to me. I want you to make the oven seven times hotter than normal. It was so hot that the people shoveling the fuel in were consumed by the flames. That's how hot it was. And the king said, throw them in the fire. And let's see what's going to happen to you. Before he did that, he asked them, why won't you bow? And they said, we only have one king, and that's Jesus. And he said, if you don't bow, you're going to die. And they said, you know what? We might die. That's entirely possible. Jesus can save us, whether he will or not, I don't know. But we're going to do it anyway. Because regardless whether we live or die, our God is our king, not you. Took him, threw him in the fire. Closed the door. Walked up on the balcony. Looked down at him. Got kind of a puzzled expression on his face. Asked one of his boys, said, come here, boy. What do you see in there? How many people did we throw in the fire? He said, we threw in three, king. And he said, well, I don't see three. I see four walking around, and one of them looks like the Son of God. Christ. <laughs> when they were in their moment of crisis, they didn't have to be afraid. They didn't have to wonder whether or not God was going to show up. He was already in the fire waiting for them. No matter what crisis our lives face, no matter where we go or what we do, you don't have to look around for Jesus. He's already there. He's waiting to rescue you. All you have to do is call on his name. We don't have to be afraid. The second thing the angel said was, come and see. There's a difference between the word look and see. When you look at something, you may not grasp completely what you're looking at. You may not comprehend or understand it, but when you truly see something, you understand, you comprehend. The angel wanted these women not just to look, but to see or grasp or understand and comprehend that the tomb really was empty and Christ had really risen from the dead. This is an invitation to our minds by the angels. God respects our intellect. He's not interested in blind faith. Our future cannot be based on some naive notion that he might be alive. Or I suppose he's alive. Or the angel said he was alive. Or the disciples told me he was alive. So I suppose he's probably alive. Now we need to base our faith in something a little more solid than that. They went to see. They went and see for themselves what was in the tomb. That it was completely empty. This is why the evidence of Jesus' resurrection is so strong. After he rose from the dead, he appeared 13 times. And one of these times was to a group of about 500 people. He did this over a period of 40 days. All the theories to explain this away are as unconvincing as the reports of the bribed guards he had about the body being stolen. Those guards that had fallen down out of fear from the angel, they went back to the boss and said, Hey boss, we got trouble. The angel came and Jesus rose up. The boss said, shh. If this gets out, the whole world will turn upside down. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a big wad of cash. If anybody asks you what happened, say the disciples snuck in at night and stole the body. And that's the story that they spread. And that's what most of the people believed. They believed what the soldiers told them. The disciples snuck in and stole the body of Jesus. But the angel wanted to make sure they knew. He said, come and see. This is an invitation often given to us in Scripture. 
He had Noah build an ark and had a picture of the animals coming to the ark for protection and salvation, just like we have to come to him today. He invited the children of Israel to come out of Egypt, which was the world, and to enter into the promised land, which is glory. He gives great invitations to us. Matthew 11 and 20 through 30 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The resurrection tells us to come out from the world and into a relationship with Jesus. To come out of the darkness and into the light. To come out of slavery and into freedom. One of the biggest misconceptions people have is there's a list of things they have to do in order to become a Christian. This is what I am. And if I want to get to heaven, this is where I need to be. So I've got these things I have to cut out of my life. I have to stop doing this, stop doing that, stop doing this. And once I get good enough, then I'll be able to come to Jesus. Then I'll be able to turn my life over to Him. Then I'll be able to be a Christian. But what they don't understand, and what's so complicated about Christianity, is its simplicity. Because when Jesus died on the cross, He gave us salvation. Already, before we ask for it. It's given to us. It's a free gift that we don't have to pay for, that we don't have to buy, that we don't have to purchase. <coughs> that doesn't make sense. In our world, it's a consumer world. I work hard, I make money, I use that money to buy the things I need. That's how these things work. No such thing as a free lunch. The only sure things in the world are death and taxes. No. Salvation's free. It's given to you not where you're going to be, but as you are. Jesus didn't die for you as a Christian. He died for you as a sinner. He died for me as a sinner. He died for all of us as a sinner because the Bible says we were all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. It doesn't matter to Jesus the list of things you've done wrong. There's not a scale in heaven where you put all the bad things on one side and all the good things on the other side. And whichever side weighs out wins. That's not the kind of God we serve. He loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die for us in spite of ourselves. In spite of our sin, in spite of our deprivation, in spite of the things we do that we know are wrong. He still loved us enough to die. And if we spend our whole lives the way we are and we die and spend eternity in hell, he still died for us. He still loved us that much to give us an opportunity to follow him. All we have to do is say yes. It's a free gift. You just have to take it. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. After the angels told him to not be afraid and told him to come and see, he told him to go and tell. The women were told to go and tell. Jesus did not intend for anyone to stare continually into the empty tomb. The empty tomb wasn't the end of the story. It was the beginning. After we come to a point of seeing the empty tomb and trusting Christ as our Savior, we're to go. We're to go and learn more about him. 2 Peter 3.18 But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. We're to go to Him in prayer. John 14, 13-14 And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If He shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. We're to go to church and fellowship with other believers. <coughs> Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We're to go to a lost and dying world. Acts 1.8 says, But ye shall receive power, and after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Both the angels and Jesus himself made this request. 
go and tell. Jesus is alive. The whole world needs to hear this. This is what gives substance to the Great Commission in the end of the chapter that we read. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. The resurrection enlarged Jesus' authority. Out of that authority comes the command to go, disciple, baptize, and teach. And in all, he promises his presence through the Holy Spirit. Once we've seen, we're supposed to go and tell everyone the good news. Sister Penny, would you come to the piano, please? There's a lot of things that explain the missionary efforts of the first century church. The power of the Holy Spirit, the commitment of those faithful disciples, the hope of heaven. The people went out and they died for their belief in the Savior. Every one of the disciples, except for one, died as a martyr, killed for preaching the gospel. What gave them the power to do this? What gave them the ability to say, it doesn't matter if we'll ever die. This message is important. Regardless of what happens to me, I need to let people know about Jesus. It's because he rose from the dead. If he never rose from the dead, the story would be over. If he never rose from the dead, there wouldn't be redemption. He would have just been another great guy. Another nice guy came along, said some great things. He died. Everybody sad he died. Move on about your lives. No. He rose. And when he rose from the dead, he changed everything. He changed everything. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Nothing is impossible. Jesus is alive. Nothing can hurt us. Jesus is alive. Nothing can stop us. Jesus is alive. Christianity spread like wildfire. Why? Jesus is alive. <coughs> you don't know where I've been. You don't know my story. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't understand how rough life is for me. It doesn't matter. Jesus is alive. All that stuff that happened to you before, that was just Friday. That's only Friday. Sunday's here. He's not on the cross anymore. He's alive. All throughout history, whenever there was sin, a sacrifice had to be made. An innocent animal had to be killed, and their blood was used as a covering for sin. They took our punishment upon them and protected us from the consequences of our actions. But the covering was only temporary, because eventually the blood ran out. It only lasted a short while, and then new blood was required. You see, our life is in our blood, and when we die, our heart stops beating, and the blood stops flowing. When there's no more blood, there's no more covering for our sins. But Jesus was different than all the other sacrifices before him. You see, Jesus is alive. I don't want to debate uh, semantics. I don't know how it will look or be once we reach heaven. But I do know Jesus was born a human being. The Bible says fully God, fully man. He grew up as a human being. He died as a human being. He arose from the grave as a human being. The Bible says he ate food. They were able to physically touch him. He ascended up into heaven as a human being. The angel said, in Acts 1.11, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall, show, shall so come back in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. And that means Jesus is coming back someday the same way he went away. A human being. And if that's the case, then every minute of every day, of every month, of every year, for well over 2,000 years, his heart is still beating. Somewhere between 60 to 100 times per minute, his heart is contracting to allow blood to flow through his body. His sacrifice wasn't a temporary fix. His blood is still flowing today. His blood never gives up, it never dries up, and it never runs out. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice because he continually produces a covering for our sins. His blood is the grace that covers us, and it is an endless supply. 
everybody bow your head and close your eyes. I know this is my last time to ever be in church. And when I close my eyes tonight, I open them in glory. I know what my eternity will hold. I know where I'll spend my future. My calling and my election is sure. And if everybody in here can say that, if when you got to heaven, if today was your day, and they opened the gates and they said, why should we let you in? Would you have an answer? Would you be able to say, because I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb, because God has forgiven me of my sins, Jesus has entered into my heart, and I'm saved? If you can say that and believe it, congratulations. If you can't, if there's any doubt in your mind that you're not for sure where you're going to go, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. Everybody's eyes are closed. Nobody can see you. Nobody's staring at you. But I want to know, if there's somebody here who can say, I'm not sure what will happen to me. I don't know what tomorrow holds. Nobody likes to be called a sinner. Nobody likes to be said, hey, you're going to hell because you're a bad person. We don't go to hell because we're bad people. We go because we're separated from God. We were born this way. But we don't have to live this way. We have a choice. Every day we have a choice. We can serve God or we can serve ourselves. We can follow God or we can follow man. And if you're ready today to make that choice, if you're ready today to say, Pastor, I'm tired of living just with myself. I know there's something more out there, something greater. And I want to be a part of it. I just want you to raise your hand. Nobody's looking. Nobody's going to embarrass you. Just raise your hand up and say, I'm not sure where I'm going to go, but I'm concerned about how my life's going to end. Anybody at all?
to condemn me or say anything that will keep me out of heaven because the blood of Jesus covers my sins. And if you pray that prayer today, if you believe what you said, the blood of Jesus covers your sins, heaven is your eternal home. And we thank you for making heaven our eternal home. And all these things we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.